Torah portion Vayakhel uh, Pekudei. In our Shabbat uh, message, we always give a uh, synopsis of the Torah portion. So I'll go ahead and just uh, read that out. Uh, in Torah portion Vayakhel, Moses assembles the Israelites after the molten calf incident to reseal the covenant. The laws of keeping the Sabbath are stated, including the law not to burn any fire in their inhabitations on the Sabbath day. We'll be focusing on that. Contributions for the tabernacle, that every wise-hearted uh, person shall make the uh, elements. The qualities of Betzalel and Oholiab, the senior craftsmen, godly spirit, wisdom, uh, insight, and knowledge. We then have the actual construction of the Mishkan and its implements. Um, and uh, then the actual dedication of the Mishkan uh, 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 at the end of Torah portion Pikdei. That's just a brief synopsis, so you'll understand where we are uh, in the reading. Uh, I'd like to say a, a couple of words about the Haftarah that I just chant, uh, uh, tra- uh, uh, chanted, and then segue over to our, uh, our Torah portion and share with you my uh, themes. Uh, our Haftarah begins with a rebuke uh, that people have not listened to the divine. And then in verse 14, in Jeremiah verse 14, it says, Return, O wayward sons, the word of Adonai, and I shall be your master. I shall take you, one from a city, two from a family, and I shall bring you to Zion. I shall appoint shepherds for you according to my own heart, and they will care for you with knowledge and wisdom. And it shall be when you multiply and become fruitful in the land in those days, the word of God, they will no longer say the ark of the covenant of God and will not co- it will not come to mind. They will not mention it and will not recall it and it will not be used anymore. At that time, the people called Jerusalem the throne of Adonai and all the nations will be gathered to her in the name of Adonai to Jerusalem, and they will no longer follow the visions of their own heart. Now, this is a pretty startling uh, statement. Lo yomru od Aron brit Adonai, because of course the Aron Kodesh is at the center of uh, the Mishkan, the tabernacle that they're building in the desert. It's the heart of the tabernacle being built in the desert. And for Jeremiah to say, they're going to completely forget about the ark uh, uh, the Ark of the Covenant with God, which implies, uh, now re- remember, during Jeremiah's time, the temple was destroyed. We don't know when Jeremiah 3 was written, but it's, it's possible that Jeremiah 3 was written when the temple had already uh, been destroyed, but he did have a vision of the people coming back. We don't have a strong sense of Jeremiah predicting the rebuilding of the temple, the second temple, as it were. I could be wrong, but I don't recall that anywhere in Jeremiah. The prophet Ezekiel, on the other hand, who was among those exiled to Babylonia, uh, much of the book of Ezekiel is a very detailed plan uh, for the building of the uh, uh, second temple, by the way, which differs from the actual plans used to be the second temple. And there's a great dispute among the rabbis how Ezekiel got his prophetic vision because it doesn't match prior visions and was never uh, actually implemented. Uh, of course, the, the lines I'm focusing on here, in addition to this startling idea, no more Ark of the Covenant, which seems to mean no more holy temple, uh, but I shall appoint shepherds for you according to my heart, and they will care for you with knowledge and wisdom. So I want to start there just for a moment and then go to our Torah portion. So uh, Ezekiel, in a way, uh, Jeremiah, in a way, and I'll talk, I've talked about this a bit, and I'll talk about it more at our gathering. Jeremiah is the transition between Israelite religion and rabbinic religion, uh, and ultimately, I'll say, modern Judaism. Uh, Jeremiah sees the inner life. Uh, In fact, he talks about the circumcision of the heart. Uh, He talks about the straying of the heart, as you see here. Now, the heart, remember, remember, is the inner life. And he seems to say, those physical structures don't see, uh, seem to be of any help. We've had that Mishkan, we've had that holy temple ever since the time of Solomon, and if you read through the book of Kings, 
it's more or less one moral disaster after another. And somebody has to say uh, the, the, the tragic truth. The temple, which is the building out of the Mishkan, hasn't seemed to make any difference in the moral life of the people. Now, that's a harsh thing. Because you know, part of what, what we are uh, extending our labor is the understanding of the Mishkan, and it's beautiful. And Aviva Zornberg de- develops this in an utterly and uniquely beautiful way. But then in my heart, having read Jeremiah, I, I know what happens in the end. Uh, for all of the uh, chokmah, for all the wisdom that goes into it, uh, once it becomes the temple and once life moves on, it doesn't make any difference. So the question is, what does make a difference? And um, so in, in Ezekiel, uh, it, uh, it's uh, haskil. Haskil is a word uh, for wisdom in Hebrew. Uh, not the usual ones, chokma, tivuna, videa, but in Jeremiah, it's da'ad uh, haskil. And uh, what is this word haskil that Jeremiah uses? And why isn't he using chokma and tivuna? Well, the Hebrew word uh, haskil is the root of the haskalah. You may have heard of uh, the Jewish Enlightenment, which followed on the European Enlightenment. And there's been a lot of study on what enlightenment means. In fact, Kant wrote an essay, What is the Enlightenment? And uh, Kant's understanding of the Enlightenment more or less is this, uh, and this fits very well with my talk on Paul Tillich last night. The enlightened means that you don't trust other people for your knowledge. Enlightenment means you don't trust other people for your knowledge, nor do other people have the right to impose their knowledge on you. Uh, Kant was talking against uh, the king of Prussia who edited uh, books being read, and it was a not very oblique critique of the idea that the job of the secular state is to tell people what they can and can't say. That somebody sitting in a, in a censor's office and telling, and telling people uh, that they're not permitted to say one thing, they're not permitted to say another. By the way, I'm reading now in the af- aftermath of uh, COVID, and there's great, great uh, uh, debate going on that certain things in, that we think, uh, uh, in retrospect, maybe sh- people should have allowed to have been said, because the idea that people aren't allowed to say contrary opinions, I think as, a, you know, as Westerners and Americans, we say, well, that's awful. Well, that's actually one thing that happened uh, uh, during COVID, uh, that we, we weren't given the the, the the choice remember and some it was social media shut down certain opinions more or less because of the direction of what I'll call the mainstream media now as you know I got vaccines uh, I wore a mask out in public however what disturbed me is the shut the shutting down of a of a of a of a debate so this is Kant's what is the enlightenment the secular authorities have no right to censor us. Be, what, whatever haskalah haskala is, whatever wisdom is, we have to be able to think and talk to each other. Now, another level haskala, according to Kant, uh, was the church. Uh, the church has no right to impose its dogma upon us. Now, Kant was a Lutheran. You know, he, the, the Lutherans had broken away from the Catholics long before, but he's speaking uh, both to the Lutheran church, Protestantism in general, Catholicism, Christianity in general, uh, religion in general, has no right to impose its dogma on people, and people have the choice of secularism. Uh, so, for so this ideal idea uh, haskil uh, in the in the philosophic sense means we get to think broadly, we get to think widely. Uh, our thoughts are not untrammeled. That's probably not what it means here. But what it means here is the root of enlightenment, because of what it re, uh, means here, and now I'm looking at the times I see the word maskil uh, and haskalah presented in other parts of the Bible. Uh, the, for example, the maskil is oftentimes uh, mentioned in the book of Proverbs. Now, the Proverbs is not about Torah. The Proverbs is about reasoning with the moral law and how bad we are at it. It's adages. I believe, I actually believe the Proverbs was a curriculum of the school system. It's adages 
Because if you don't remember adages and you come up with a conflict, a, a, a conflict or a question, you're not going to remember the moral law. So, for example, uh, uh, oh, by the way, I'm beginning my wisdom work classes uh, this week. Again, if you haven't taken them, please do. If you need a review, please jump in there. They're on Tuesday nights because I don't want to have to break for uh, uh, a Passover. Uh, so uh, what is one of my ad adages? No criticizing, no complaining, no condemning. Do not engage in escalating conflict. And people say, never? I said, look, never is a long time. Give it a month. So you can go a whole month without pointing out the error of someone's ways. See if you can go a whole month without using the word why as a complaint. Why didn't do your homework? Why are you sho your shoes there? Why didn't you change the oil? That's a complaint. Say it straight. Go a whole month without any condemnation. No accusing, blaming, labeling, unkindly comparing, contemptuous gestures of face and hands. Watch your tone of voice, no cutting down, no putting down. All that is out. So people say, well, what do I do if someone's doing something wrong? I say, take a deep breath. Uh, and now that you know that criticizing, complaining, condemning, obviously including escalating comment is out, you're going to have to carry a different toolbox. Meaning once virtue has, has left those things out and you want to talk to somebody about something they've done wrong, uh, connecting again to Tillis last night, you'll have to go deep within you. You have to ask yourself, how do I communicate some, something to somebody true without hurting them? That's a pretty worthwhile question. If you have a truth to tell somebody and they need to hear it, criticizing, complaining, condemning, typically over the long run does a lot more harm than damage. So I put this under Haskalah in the proverb sense which means the wisdom to understand uh, what the Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutato calls the drachim and hergelim of the inner life. The drachim and hergelim, the ways and habits of the inner life, uh, you know, when we're criticized, we tend to shut down or feel very bad. We feel wounded. Uh, sometimes uh, criticism is not for the benefit of the other, but just for us to let things out. So I want you to think for this of idea of the haskil. First of all, um, how to focus the conduct of your moral life down into the fine points. You don't just say, well, I think I'm a moral person. Because we're going to ask your spouse, people you work with, we're going to ask your children, other people, we're going to ask everybody the questionnaire, how well does this person observe the fine, the fine points of the moral life? So that's, that's one meaning of uh, Haskalah. So when I think of the, the, the shepherds of our people teaching us de'a, I'll talk about that in a moment, but also lahaskil. Now, another meaning of lahaskil, we've seen this over in the book of Daniel, lahaskil are the mystics. So here's uh, two great ranges of one word. In the book of Proverbs, it's used as a person who can self-regulate and doesn't damage people in interpersonal uh, communication. And in other places, the maskil is the one who is connected to the wisdom, you know, beyond the heights of heaven. What's the connection between them? I'll say that here. Uh, I've met people who uh, meditate, go along. Uh, go, I'm, I'm, I'm chuckling because I've said this many times. Go to week-long meditation retreats. Um, maybe consider themselves a maskil, an enlightened person. And they come home and with three days, they're back to their old habits. People say, Rabbi Finley, you should do ayahuasca. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to do ayahuasca. But I have many people trying to uh, entice me. I said, so what's it like? They said, well, they have all this stuff. And I said, I probably had a, a lower version of that, so I don't, I don't need to take that drug to do that. But tell me how it goes. They say, wow, all these profound insights, and I know who I am, and I understand things better. I said, okay, I'm going to call you a couple of weeks, and you tell me how things are. And basically, yeah, it's all gone back to normal. Um, so you get, you get a weekend high, uh, you know, the mystic. And then with the, now I'm not saying this is true for everybody. I'm saying everybody that I know who was trying to talk me into it, I, was, I would say, call me in a couple of weeks. Has the transformation been ingrained into you? Is it relatively permanent? Uh, so from my perspective, the test of the mystic who can reach into the mysteries of the divine, can that person return to this realm 
as a maskil in the sense of the book of Proverbs, which means has wisdom about the inner life, the interpersonal life, can regulate within and uh, and make a difference in our interpersonal relationships and ultimately uh, uh, morality in the world. Now, with that said, and I think it's uh, an, an important thing to say, it's something, by the way, that, that guides my teaching continuously. When I would re- teach the uh, spirituality, spiritual psychology of Kabbalah, uh, people would want to go into the depths of it. I say, first, we got to talk about virtue. Nine-tenths virtue, one-tenth mysticism. Because becoming a mystic and returning into a vessel that can't hold the light in a proper way for me is, you know, sounds strong. It's an abomination. You know, you're going to take that wisdom and come down here and be unkind to people. It's just better to be unkind to people than than, than desecrate that wisdom. Now, uh, into our Parsha, um, again, Zornberg is just way too dense to, to, to uh, summarize. Uh, by the way, another word about uh, Zornberg. Uh, the benefit of Zornberg uh, is beauty. Uh, she's a beautiful writer. She takes you to places that you don't expect to go. She integrates sources. She brings in philosophers. She brings in theorists from so many different dimensions. Uh, she goes out, down into the depths of a passage that you could never, ever imagine. She brings it up and connects it to uh, another depth. It's one reason she's so difficult to read, because if you're going to listen to Rabbi Jonathan Sachs on the Parsha, uh, boom, bam, <laughs> you read a couple pages and you got it. Thank, thank you, Rabbi Sachs, a blessed memory. Well, reading Aviva Zornberg is almost the opposite. It takes me an entire week to read one of her portions well. I got to start on Sunday for the next uh, uh, Saturday. I can only absorb two or three pages at a time. So if you're trying to read Zornberg at the recommend at my recommendation and Sherry Manning's recommendation, and you say, I just get lost. This is too dense. Well, welcome to the club. I don't know how fast Sherry Manning re- reads Zornberg, uh, but it, I, I have a maximum absorption of three or four pages at a time, space it out through the day, and, and take it for a week. So I want to share with you just a few themes that I can uh, share with you that I think will be meaningful to you. So she points out, uh, first of all, a, a, a fascinating uh, structure in, the, in our story. Uh, the story begins with Moses' encounter at the burning bush. A, uh, uh, he hears the angel, labat ha'esh, labat from the word lev, from the heart of the fire, and it's a bush that is not consumed. Now, it gets right away to God uh, speaking to him, the angel speaking to him, and then his mission to Sinai. And I don't know if, if we've ever waxed at length on this idea. Uh, there's a fire in the bush, but the bush was not consumed. Uh, when you go back to some of the resources that Zornberg talks about, we just have to sit there for a moment. Now, remember, these are people that live very close to nature, we, unimaginably uh, uh, close to nature. Um, and unimaginable, and, and if we go further back in human time, you know, with the with Prometheus giving fire to, to the people, or however we got fire, whoever invented it, whoever stumbled upon it, whoever made some kind of plate, I don't know out of what, uh, whoever put some metal in a fire and saw metal separate into different parts. Can you imagine the number of years before metallurgy came into existence where people could, could define the, the metals that we see here, that people understood the, 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 had names and understood the features of precious stones, we take it for granted. Try to imagine being in a time where none of this was known and someone showed you how to melt metal and someone showed you uh, mixtures of metals and what they created. So this is just, it is really astonishing to me. Uh, I know nothing how that's done. I know nothing about how anybody invented it. I know about the, I know about the history of modern metallurgy because I study it, and it seem, still seems to be utterly miraculous to me. It's all connected to fire. Um, and that's where I think the, uh, the myth of Prometheus is so pr- profound, is because once we're given fire, um, we can do just about anything. Yeah, with our stone axes, we can cut down trees and things like that. But if we're going to master metal, uh, if we're going to make uh, 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 certain kinds of tools uh, that we don't have to 
chop down a tree using a, a tree trump. Uh, we can actually use something more efficient. When you think of what, what metal meant, or I'm sorry, or a sharpened rock, would, I think was the way they had to do it before. You, you can create an, an ax handle. So the idea of Prometheus, uh, who is punished by the gods, it's fire that changes everything. And now we look at the bush on fire and was not consumed. I want you to imagine, uh, if, by the way, if you've ever seen a wildfire, uh, I remember once when we were driving up north and, and we looked out our window and there was a house on fire. Uh, I, I looked at, we, we pulled over, and I just looked in horror at how violent the fire was at it, at it, as it consumed the house. The fire engines weren't on the way. We didn't have to call 911. And how violent and, and, and voracious it seemed that the fire needed to eat up this house fast. Looking at the fire, it seemed that this that wood was prey in the mouth of the fire. I'd never, I don't think I'd ever seen anything that violent on that kind of a scale. I've never been in a, in a wildfire in the woods or anything. First time I ever saw a house utter, utterly consumed uh, uh, with fire. So fire in those days was something that if it broke out, and you see this in the Talmud and in the Bible, if fire broke out, oy va voy, it will take out fields and fields and fields. It'll take up everything in your silo. It will, it will rage ruin uh, in minutes. So people were terrified of fire. Uh, but on the other hand, fire, which, in, which is an utterly mysterious thing, by the way, in the Kabbalah, we have meditations where we put a candle and, uh, and we look at the flame of the candle and you look so deeply that you can look at every shade of the color in the candle and just stay right there. And then you can actually see the black fire. Uh, you can see all the levels of fire, but you can see the black fire. And that's a, a core meditation because you know, in the Kabbalah they say, what is black fire? What is the fire that you can't see? And that is, as we see in our Torah portion, connected to the fire within. So now what Zornberg focused on this Torah portion is the character Bitzalel, uh, the, the master craftsman uh, and his assistants, and the idea that uh, God has a vision of what the Mishkan is supposed to look like. Uh, God reveals it to Moses, as you know, in Torah portion, Truma and Tetzaveh. Uh, God chooses uh, Bitzalel because he has uh, Ruach Elohim and then Chokmah, Tvunah, Vedat, different kinds of wisdom. Uh, it says, um, uh, let me actually just uh, read from that for a moment because he's such an important person in our uh, uh, Parsha. Uh, and, and this is repeat. Uh, uh, um, it's from Kitisa and then repeated in our Pasha, Parsha. Um, I have, this is chapter 31, verse 3. Now, remember, this is like, um, uh, uh, like a Prometheus who stole fire and gave it to people, but, but a different kind of person where God has taught uh, Bezalel craftsmanship, like Tubal Cain, if I'm not mistaken, over in the, uh, in the book of Exodus. I have filled him with godly wisdom, uh, a godly spirit, Ruach Elohim. Amale oto Ruach Elohim, bechokma uvetvuna uvedat. I have filled him with godly spirit. I have filled him with wisdom. I have filled him with insight. I have filled him with knowledge. And then it says, uvechol melacha, and every kind of craft or toil. Now, melacha is the is the uh, catch-all word for malacha, and if you say it in the Orthodox world, it's malacha, and it's the 39 things you can't do on Shabbos. But what it captures is everything we need, we do to produce civilization. Uh, it's, it's not just kicking dirt. You know, when you think of the malacha, of everything that we have, uh, you know, I, I remember when I was teaching at the rehab center, and we would talk about gratitude, and people would say what they're gratitude for. I would say, I'm grat grateful for the sidewalk. They said, what? I said, I said, the army of civil engineers who built this. Uh, somebody who turned taxpayer money and put a budget together. 
And when I look at freeways, when I look at buildings um, carefully as uh, architectural poems, uh, just, you know, what we saw, you know, in tearing out our old funky garage and putting our studio in here or watching step by step the, 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 the building of the oratorial facility back in the day. Uh, it was a stupendous thing to, to, to see. Um, you know, we have a ceramic shop nearby that I, I, I might some of. I took a lapidary course when I was overseas, never finished it, but you know what it meant to grind precious stones. So we have to take, we have to take a, a breath back and say, what does it mean to be filled with godly spirit, wisdom, insight, and knowledge? Behold melacha, everything needed to build civilization, everything needed to build, uh, to build structures. Now, we have a really wonderful phrase. It says, Lachshov Machshavot. Anybody who knows Hebrew knows, Lachshov Machshavot means to think thoughts. That is a Hebrew of a much later generation because in this book and uh, later on in Torah portion, Vayakel, Lachshov Machshavot means to weave designs. To weave designs. Uh, so later on, when Machshava is called thought, uh, by the way, which we have in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, that kol makshavo libo rak rak kol ayom, all of the thoughts of his heart are bent on evil all day long. One reason we know that that text is a, is an, is a much later Jeremiah or Deuteronomic te- uh, text, because prior to that, Lakshov Machshava meant to weave, to weave patterns. Somebody sat around and said, what do you call this thing going on in our heads? And they had no physical name for it. And someone said, it feels like weaving. It feels like we're weaving patterns in here. And uh, look, I, I wasn't on the uh, language committee uh, back in the time of Jeremiah, but I can just imagine someone saying, well, that's pretty brilliant. Yeah, it feels like there's a weaving operation, a spinning operation going on inside of our heads. Let's go ahead and call whatever that is. We're going to call it Machshava. The word got around, and people thought it was brilliant, and then people forgot that it was invented. So when I see that uh, Betzalel, uh, uh, that he was Lachshov um, Machshavo, uh, of course, I'm going to go ahead and read it in a Midrashic way, as Zornberg did. And yes, he knew how to do all this work. And yes, he knew how to weave patterns. The main thing he knew how to do was think. The main thing he knew how to do was think. Godly spirit, wisdom, insight, knowledge, all of those combining in how to think. And when I say think, when, if I'm going to take godly spirit, uh, wisdom, which is a, the, a kind of the haskalah that I talked about earlier, tivuna, which is from the word bain, which means insight of the difference between things, Dath, a kind of an organic knowledge, where we think to, to know God. It's used for sexual relationship, probably referring to the, to the unity when the male and female body connect. Uh, but it's used throughout uh, Torah. And I, I'll, I'll show people some places when we, uh, in Jeremiah, when we gather on, uh, at our meetup, uh, that the word Dath, uh, outside the Garden of Eden, that the word Dath has a sense of you know, I'm going to say knowledge that comes from the soul, knowledge that is working within us and then arrives in the mind. The job of the mind is to reflect upon the truths given up by the soul, uh, but the job of the mind, uh, I'm sorry, but, but what arrives in the mind, uh, uh, you might say is sensory experience, but as Kant shows us, no sensory experience arrives raw. It arrives through categories of knowledge that we didn't create and we barely know about. So where are these categories of categories of, uh, of, uh, of experience? Where are these categories of perception that Kant knows about? They're somewhere buried in the inner life, and the soul is my, my catch-all term for this. So when people say to me, isn't experience raw? This might be a, too, a bit too philosophical for most people, but the answer is no. Everything comes through the lens of the Kantian categories of knowledge. Uh, it's complex that you can look it up. Uh, uh, I, I want to share with you, I, um, 
um, you know, w- when people share with me with something, you know, I think of it simply as how do you frame something? How do you frame a, be- you know, when you want to tell a story, here's the beginning and here's the end. Uh, when you go outside and you see something beautiful, when I walk outside, how do I build the frame? I take a camera. Well, I, I'm zooming in, zooming out. Now, what, what am I saying? I'm taking a picture. Know what you part of what you're doing is you are building a frame. Where does framing come from? Where does stories come from? Where does structure come from? Where does syntax, t- syntax, grammar, the meanings of words, it's all in an unconscious realm. And then the mind uh, tries to uh, make something of it. So this is what I'm, when Zornberg talks about the inner fire, I want to use her term for this, especially the realm of imagination and fantasy, because there's a part of this where she refers to the uh, book of Ezekiel, and there are rabbis who say, but that, that's not exactly right. It says uh, he built it as, as God told him, but then there's an assumption that, that uh, uh, Bezalel, put a little bit of his own touch on things. Ezekiel's uh, uh, second temple actually doesn't look like the second temple that was built. Where'd he get those ideas? So the, the rabbis who, are remember, are successors to the prophets, and the job of the prophets is to share the word of God, not repeat what they read in the Torah, but to share, but to share an experience of God, I think ultimately a mystical experience of God, in a new way to direct exactly what was happening with the people of their times. So when I think of the inner fire, uh, um, part of the inner fire is, of course, the soul and all of that, but part of that inner fire, uh, that, that, that ner, that lamp of God that wants to percolate into our life, is not exactly what God tells us. And by the way, I, I told you I'd connect this with Paul Tillich last night. Um, one reason Paul Tillich broke from traditional Lutheranism and traditional religion in general is that it disforms the human being. Because when you're any, under any kind of dogmatic system where you have to talk a certain way, think a certain way, use certain words, not use other words, yeah, not offend anybody, that the most important thing is not to make anybody feel bad. Uh, you can imagine what I think about that. Um, that, that, that Kant saw uh, that uh, 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 Kant and Nietzsche and others, that dogmatism disforms the human being. And uh, part of what uh, the, the fire within is that imagination takes its own course. Uh, Zornberg here talks about the experience of the uncanny. Well, I haven't read about the uncanny in any dogmatic statement of any religion, including the principles of Reform Judaism. When it talks about following a hint, something happens and you feel you've been hinted at. Nobody can tell you how to do that. And she goes on and on about the creative process. This is part of what the most beautiful about Zornberg is. She goes on and on in the creative process and... uh, and, and the legions of workers who, wrote, who, who arrived that were hachme lev, that, that had wisdom in the heart, the nadav libo and generous hearted, they didn't even know they were these kinds of people until, the op, uh, until, it, uh, 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 until it appeared. So try to imagine you're watching something going on and say, uh, you know, I think I can learn how to cut stones. Or you see what's going on and you say, you know, I think I can do that wood carving. Give it a try. So why do I say this? I, 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 I've asked, I, you know, I've known some super athletes now and then, and I said, <clears throat> when is the first time you thought? And they said, I saw somebody else doing it, and I said to myself, I think I can do that. That's soul knowledge. Uh, so there's, you might say, the, the fire within all of that. By the way, I, I've been right, I've been, I started my book, uh, The Soul of the Child, so I realized I had to have a, a, a little... Um, definition for what I mean by soul. Not that I'm going to quote this in my book, but it's just for personal uses. I'll probably teach some version of this in one of my classes coming up, uh, but I, I'd, like to, I'd like to read this to you, and if anybody likes it, give me a like. I use the word soul as a catch-all for the inner life that is deeper than our ego states. 
I do not mean soul in a religious sense, but I don't exclude that. I speak of the soul as having metaphorically 15 chambers. There's a chamber for Freud's theories and a chamber for Jung's theories. The chamber of our personalities. A chamber of wounds and trauma. A a chamber of forgotten prayers. A chamber of unwritten poems. In one chamber, there's the dream factory. Crews of writers and directors and set designers putting on plays about our uh, inner lives every time we go to sleep and dream. And these exquisite plays are mostly unseen and forgotten. There's the uh, chamber of the shadow that Jung talks about. The parts of ourselves that we've pushed out so far is not available to the conscious mind. That shadow it can be filled with ghosts and demons that can haunt us and fill us with fears and anxieties our whole life. There's a chamber of our mostly deeply held values, usually organized around love, justice, truth and beauty, and notions of the good and sacred. There's a chamber of identity formation and development. There's a chamber of hatred and resentment. Chambers of guilt and shame. Chambers of hope and vision. Chambers of music and poetry. Chambers of image, imagination, and fantasy. A chamber of passion, skills, and talents waiting for their turn a chamber of the burning fountain of God's presence, God's love and grace attempting to flow into our lives. Chambers and more chambers revealing themselves when we engage in soul work. When I think of the soul, I keep in mind my own brief quoting and paraphrasing paraphrasing of a few lines from James Hillman's Revisioning Psychology. It's not a quote from Hillman. It's my paraphrasing a quote from Hillman. Uh, The soul is an unknown component of the inner life that makes meaning possible, deepens events into experience, and makes possible the the imaginative possibilities of the world that we live in. We experience the soul through reflection, speculation, dreams, and fantasies. In the soul, we experience life primarily as filled with symbols and metaphors. And now Finley again, last little paragraph. I believe the soul is always at work, mutely operating in a subterranean realm, parallel with our conscious lives up on the surface. Life is inestimably better if we live lives connected to the soul, where the upper and lower know of each other. Lives where we integrate our conscious life and the reflective work in the active life of the soul. That's my uh, definition of soul that I, I wrote this week, I'm sure I'm going to uh, forbesser it, but uh, when I read Zornberg and the Fire Within, I thought to myself, I'm going to say soul. And then she talks about the Mishkan, uh, and the Mishkan, which means the metals of the Mishkan are rooted in fire. Basalel can manage the fire. Uh, we go back to the fire, uh, she does, into which uh, Aaron threw the gold, and the golden calf came out of it. Now, where did that come from? Uh, you know, the sense that you know, Aaron may have, a, have had a little more to do with it than just throw, throwing it into a sack or something and it popped out. Uh, we think Aaron's not telling the whole story. But we all know that the, uh, uh, the tools of civilization become the weapons of civilization, and everything we know can be turned against each other. And that may have been the, the God's... R- reticence in giving human beings fire because they would know, yeah, they'll be able to stay warm and, uh, and, and use an ax to chop down a tree to build a house. Uh, but they're also going to cut off people's heads with axes and throw people into fires. So the gods go, so there's that. Uh, so now that you have it, are you going to be careful with it? The answer in human history is mostly, but with some egregious, uh, counter examples. Uh, that we use fire for the worst ends. So she compares the the good use of the inner life and fire as the mishkan, which is the ideal. But Jeremiah says, in the end, it meant nothing. Uh, She compares the fire of the molten calf to the fire of the mishkan, the two uh, uh, symbolic uh, uh, misuses. 
So in 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 this all this density of uh, of Zornberg, I had to pick out just a couple of things that I thought would be uh, useful to all of you, and uh, then I'll take a quick break and then uh, come back with comments and questions uh, led by Sherry Manning. Uh, in, uh, in the Musar literature, fire is mostly connected with the with the fire of aggression, anger, resentment. Anything that produces what I call the four C's, anything that makes you want to cut down a person, humiliate a person, put down a person, sometimes even in the most oblique way, that comes from the fire. And when it comes out, it burns. And the rabbis say that that fire is idolatrous, as, as does Zornberg. Why? Because the fire, when you get in that kind of a state, one thing it says, I don't know if this is physiologically true, it burns fat in the body. It's an altar of the fat in the body, and it's altered to a demon god. Just think about this. Anger is an altar to a demon god. It's a sacrifice to a demon god. Uh, when the rabbis think about the Yetzer Hara, they know it has to be motivated. I don't believe they use fire with the Yetzirah, but the motivation comes from somewhere. You know, something's an animated deep in the inner life to do it this way and, you know, this other way instead of the good way. So when I think of the, uh, the, 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 the fire, and I'll say this is the fire of the burning bush, it's a fire that is not consumed. And in the end, it can make the golden calf, the molten calf. It can make the mishkan. Or it can produce the history that ended up with the Mishkan and the temple uh, being uh, destroyed. So what do we do? I want to go back to last night. Uh, one, of the most, one of the most impressive things about uh, Paul Tillich. And uh, his complete redefinition of the word faith, having nothing to do with belief, which means belief in a dogma for which you have uh, little evidence. So, for example, I believe in God without the evidence. Okay, that's a, that's a belief. Tillich isn't interested in that. You know, may your beliefs be good and lead you to, to do good things. I'm not talking about that. Tillich has completely re redefined the word faith as an attitude, a state of being, a force of integration of the personality that includes doubt, that reaches for something transcendent and is open to the transcendent. So he calls that faith. As I was reading it, I thought to myself, you should, you should have used a better word because it's going to confuse a lot of people. And then I thought, you know, if you want to take a word and redefine it, if enough people catch up to you, because we have the word belief, we don't need a um, Belief is from German, beloved. Uh, faith is from Latin, loyal. Uh, you want to take a word and change the, 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 the semantic content with a good reason, kind of connected to religion, you know? Gesundheit, hey, go with health. And, and I'm glad he did, because sometimes when people say, are you a person of faith? I say, yeah, but not what you think. Uh, I'm more in the Tillish style of striving to be a, a person of faith. So now try to think that before you get to any religion, before you study Torah, before you light Shabbos candles, before you do anything that you consider religious or spiritual, Start with a contemplative moment. Try to experience the integration of the self, the path towards self-actualization, uh, self-realization that so many humanistic psychologists write about. Which means, in my mind, you'll have to look at the ego states that are at war with each other. Or if you learn the minister's practice, you got to do the minister's practice, which means there are things we have to do to integrate that goes on within, and you have to actually sit there and do it. If you don't make time for it, it's not going to happen. And that's the thing we learned from Shabbat, and I'll conclude here. Shabbat, uh, the fire is we're, we're on unlimited building programs. Build, 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 build. And then Shabbat says, and stop one day a week and do this. And a Hasidic saying, and one-seventh of every day and one-seventh of uh, every minute. What is that we're supposed to do? I'm going to follow Tillish. Work on personal integration 
I think of the eagle states at war with their, themselves. I think of the minister's practice. I've taught in other places. There's a disarray in the inner life. It is not integrated. Okay? It is disintegrated. And if we don't take Shabbos time, uh, Sh- Shabbos is a good time to do it. You know, but sometimes for me, Shabbos is so busy that, you know, my, my head is elsewhere. So I have to use the one-seventh of another day. Uh, and I, I'm more on the one-seventh of, uh, 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 of every hour. Meaning my, my contemplative practices are relatively brief, but very focused on inner knowledge of my ego states and working on integration of my ego states and ending with being connected to my values that include love, justice, truth, and and beauty. Lock myself there. I've done my first daily practice, no anger and criticism. Second daily practice, working on my ego states, uh, which is integrative work. Landing on my core values and, and, and feeling as if I'm set, like I hit a hard return. It's engraved to the hard disk. I breathe and I say, I, I really want to do this. Um, uh, you know what? One, one odd thing that happens uh, when I do this work, and I, I don't know the connection my soul knows, I'm not afraid of death. Uh, because what I'm doing is something that's eternal. Uh, I just I want enough in my life to live according to this. But part of myself that connects myself to eternity in the tillish sense of, the God beyond God is exactly this. So, in my summarizing uh, Zornberg, uh, I've given just a tiny bit of her brilliance. I want you to think of the f- the, the fire within, the fire that animates Betzalel and can create beauty and sanctuaries, um, the fire that created the, the the molten calf, the the fire that can that can destroy everything, and the fire of anger. And the fire that can animate uh, 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 holy work, that can animate our building uh, a mishkan within, a, a center of the self built in beauty. My center of self does not look like the mishkan. I mean, I have a description of it. My, my soul gave me a description. I like it. But I can see it. I can see the, the, what the building of my soul that my soul gave me. It's, you know, it's not permanent, but it, it's there. So I hope you all do this. I, I hope you all take a moment and, and you go down to the center of your soul and say, you know, if it were an architectural poem, what might it look like? You know, your dream factory is going to give you an image. You don't have to always use that image. And then imagine your deeply held values. And imagine your deeply held values moving up into the world of the mind so the mind can think about them and drill them and Make sure that they say that they stay present. So I hope you've enjoyed my attempt to uh, uh, summarize uh, uh, Aviva Zornberg in the um, you know uh, in too short a sense, but I had to just take a couple of things that uh, that I think I can make useful to you. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the way that I've tried to summarize and condense uh, Paul Tillich, my work to combine the two of them and give you useful practices that can transform your lives as they've transformed my life.